Greetings all. Welcome to another Tuesday Talk. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about technology and some of the new things that are happening in technology and uh, second language uh, teaching. We're going to look at a little bit at authorware and some uh, conferencing software, some AI, and then of course we need to figure out what we as teachers need to be doing with all of this new technology and how we can make wise choices. Let's uh, jump right in here to a little bit of an introduction. Technology continues to evolve, as you all know. But the interesting thing is how we can take this new technology and apply it to language teaching, language assessment, and of course, language learning. And so it's interesting to see how language is continually evolving, continuously evolving. Um, and it allows for new ways of doing things, new ways of trying to interact with your students and also with those technologies. I want to show you a little quick uh, a video that's actually on YouTube. Uh, it's a video that uh, shows a little bit about um, uh, some new technologies and those new technologies and what they can do. This is actually a TED series uh, on technology. It's, about, it's called The Sixth Sense. And uh, so I'd highly recommend that you go watch it at TED, the full thing. This is only going to be about seven minutes. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy. Maybe not. You can carry your digital world with you wherever you go with you. You can start using any surface, any wall around you as an interface. The camera is actually tracking all your gestures. Whatever you are doing with your hands is understanding that gesture. And actually, if you see, there are some color markers that in the beginning version we were using over there. You can start painting on any wall, that you stop by a wall and start painting on that wall. But we are not only tracking here one finger. We are giving you the freedom of using all the both of hands. So you actually can use both of your hands to zoom into or zoom out a map just by pinching operation over here. The camera is actually doing just the, getting all the images, it's doing the age recognition and also the color recognition and like uh, so many small algorithms are going inside. So technically it's a little bit so complex, but it gives you an output which is more intuitive to use in some sense. But I'm more excited that you can actually take it outside rather than getting your camera out of your pocket, you can just do the gesture of taking a photo now the interesting thing here is this is the actual device and the device is actually it's a camera it's a projector and these are connected to the phone in his pocket that allow him to do all of these things at the same time this is a new technology and what he calls it is a sixth sense okay how can we use this stuff to do our teaching and that's my issue let's go back to the video and it takes photo for you right? Thank you. And later I can find a wall, any, anywhere a wall, and start browsing these photos. Or maybe, okay, I want to modify this photo a little bit and send it as an email to a friend. So, so we are looking for an, an era where computing will actually merge with the physical world. And of course, if you don't have any surface, you can start using your palm for simply operation. I'm here, I'm dialing a phone number just using my hand. The camera is actually not only understanding your hand movements, but interestingly is also able to understand what objects you are holding in your hand. What we are doing here is actually, for example, in this case, the book cover is matched with so many thousands of, or maybe millions of books online and checking out which book it is. Once it has that information, it finds out more reviews about that or maybe uh, New York Times had a sound over you on that, so you can actually hear on a physical book as a review Churchill of a sound. gave a famous talk at Harvard University. This was Thank Obama's uh, last visit uh, last week Thank to you, MIT. MIT. And in particular, I want to thank two outstanding uh, MIT. So I was seeing the live of his talk outside uh, in just a newspaper. Your newspaper will show you live of your weather information rather than having updated like a, you have to check your computer in order to do that, right? When I'm going back, uh, I can just use my boarding pass and to check, uh, oh, my flight has been how much delayed. Because at that particular time, I'm not feeling of opening my iPhone and checking out a particular icon. And I think this technology will not only change the way, yes, it will change the way we interact with people also, not only the physical world. The fun part is like I'm going to Boston Metro and playing Pong game inside the train 
on, on the ground, right? And I think the imagination is the only limit of what you can think of where this kind of technology merging with the real life. But many of you argue actually that all of our work is not only about physical objects. We actually do a lots of uh, accounting and paper editing and all this kind of thing. What about that? And many of you are actually excited about the next generation tablet computers to come out in the market. So rather than waiting for that, I actually made my own um, and just using a piece of paper. So what here I did is uh, remove the camera, the ca all the cameras, webcam, have a microphone inside that camera. I removed that microphone from that. And then just pinch that, like I just make a clip out of that microphone and clip that to a piece of paper, any paper that you found around. So now this, the sound of the touch is exactly getting me when exactly I'm touching the paper. But the camera is actually tracking where my fingers are moving. You can of course watch movies. Good afternoon. My name is Russell and I am a wilderness explorer in Tri-54. And you can of course play games. Uh, here the camera is actually understanding how you're holding the paper and playing the car racing game. Many of you already must have thought, okay, you can browse, yeah, of course you can browse uh, to any, any website, so you can do all sorts of computing on a piece of paper wherever you need it. So, but more interestingly, I'm interested that how we can take that in a more dynamic way. When I come back to my desk, I can just pinch that information back to my desktop so that I can use my, my full-size computer. And why only computers? We can, we can just play with papers. Like paper world is interesting uh, to play with. So here I'm taking a part of a document and putting over here the second part of us from second place. And I'm actually modifying the information that I have over there. Yeah, and then I'm saying, okay, let's, this, is, this looks nice. Let me print it out, that thing. So I have a now printout of that thing and now, so the, the workflow is more intuitive the way that we used to do before, maybe 20 years back rather than now switching between these two worlds. So as a last thought, I think that integrating information to our everyday objects will not only help us to get rid of the digital divide, the gap between these two worlds, but it will also help us in some way to stay human, to, to be more connected to our physical world. And it will actually help us not end up being machines sitting in front of another machines. So that's all. Thank you. I hope you can see that uh, there are a lot of technologies that are out there that are going to dramatically change how we teach language. Um, he has basically, with just this one little device that's wrapped around his neck, eliminated almost a dozen other machines that we would normally have. Uh, he's also brought information to places that we wouldn't normally have. Uh, lots of different things that can be done because of just this man's idea using off-the-shelf off-the-shelf hardware. So we see that with these mobile devices we can do a lot of things. I know now that with, with newer phones um, that have newer technologies, there's software applications being made all the time that allow you to do things that you couldn't do in the past. And so we have this new hardware, this new miniaturization, this new mobility, and we have the dreamers. People who are saying, Gee, how can I take this and incorporate it into something to make my life easier, to make my life more productive? Uh, and again, we as language teachers should be thinking the exact same thing. How can I be using these technologies to further help students learn, to further help students uh, acquire language? Um, so there is this progression, um, e even this, the, the sixth sense is a, a couple of years old at least uh, from the research uh, vantage point. They are trying to actually uh, develop a system so that they can actually go out and sell these. I believe they're actually beginning to sell some of them. Um, but what will this do to teaching? And that's going to be the big thing that I'm looking at. So there's a lot of future coming up uh, with the advent of new technologies and then how we use and incorporate them into our courses. Uh, take a little bit uh, look at some of the things that are currently out there already, things like authorware systems, LMSs, CCMSs, and CMSs. With regard to authorware, you probably have already heard of uh, things like hot potatoes, 
and uh, Malted and SlideShare um, and also EXE. We'll take a look at uh, just a couple of those real quick. Um, Hot Potatoes is a piece of software that you should have seen already. Uh, it's an application that allows you to create materials for your uh, for your students. It's downloadable. It is available on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and it allows you to create things like multiple choice questions, fill in the blanks, uh, matching, uh, close type of activities, and you can then make them, print them out, put them on a web page, um, and the like. So you have a lot of different things that you can do with um, with this particular piece of software. Now the nice thing about Hot Potatoes is because they're web accessible and they automatically check answers, uh, there's a lot that you can do with them. You can also add audio to them. You can add a timer to them. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do with these uh, materials. Uh, Hot Potatoes also requests slash requires you to make your materials available to anybody else so that we have more materials that are available for people. So you may not be a materials developer, but there's probably people out there already using Hot Potatoes so that they can um, go out and do things. Uh, um, so I'm sorry, so that you can go out and do things with the, the stuff that's already been made. Um, There's something called Malted, which is a multimedia authoring uh, for language tutors and educational development. I have yet to use this software, but it does seem very interesting. It uh, allows people to develop materials again. Uh, again, it's available on Mac, Windows, and Linux, so it's, a, uh, it's an open source thing. It has a sound recorder in it, so you can record sounds. Um, it has a text input so that you can input text. So again, it's going to be similar in some sense to Hot Potatoes. It's also going to be available through the web. Um, EXE uh, software is actually for building lessons. Uh, and it is an excellent uh, program if you are interested in developing full-fledged lessons. Um, it's a program that allows you to create not just individual activities, but you can stream one piece after another after another. Um, and so it's much more like an editor. Uh, it's a little more difficult to use, but it's also more powerful. Um, it's also able to make materials that are SCORM compliant. Um, SCORM, compli SCORM we'll talk about in, ju in just a... Well, actually, let's talk about SCORM now. SCORM is a set of parameters for creating materials. I always look at it as, uh, as uh, something like a barcode. You know, when you look on the back of a book, you have a barcode, right? And that barcode has uh, some meaning for, um, for book dealers and sellers, actually almost anything that you buy and sell now. It also makes the buying and selling of materials easier. Inventory is now easier. Uh, setting up a shop is now easier because you have all of these barcodes. In a similar fashion, SCORM makes it easier to create materials teaching materials because things, components, have become standardized. For example, you've got pre-activities, you have assessments, uh, you have reading activities, you have uh, comprehension checks, and they can all be categorized into segments to make life easier for you as a, as a language learner. Now, most of the people that I know don't even have never even heard of SCORM. But if you learn SCORM, you'll be able to work for uh, larger uh, companies, the military, for creating um, SCORM-compliant materials. EXE will actually allow you to create materials in the EXE editor and then save it as a SCORM-compliant activity or, or lesson. Um, and then you can use it and reuse it in a variety of places. Um, so that's what SCORM is. So we've got these authorware packages, things like Hot Potatoes, things like Malted, things like EXE, uh, and SlideShare. SlideShare allows you to create um, activities online, I'm sorry, uh, presentations online. Uh, let's jump to a new one first, right? So you're allowed to create a presentation online <clears throat> or upload a PowerPoint and then use that and add audio to it and so it looks like kind of like the thing that I'm making here. 
Um, if you want to do it for free, you can, and your materials are available for everyone, and you have limited capability. If you want to pay for uh, the pro version, uh, you can do more things with it. You can hide your materials. You can add your personal logo to it. Um, so they give you other capabilities, but there's also a free element to it as well if you're so inclined to go to go that route. All of these materials, these authorware materials, are designed for uh, teachers, and materials developers, to actually create material, create media. Um, they're not designed to manage a classroom. To la they're not designed to manage a learning environment. That's what these systems do. Okay, an LMS, which is a learning management system, um, a CCMS, which is a course content management system, and then a CMS, which is a content management system uh, or class management system. It's a little confusion with CMS because CMS was originally taken by the technology industry to mean content management system. So, for example, if you're running a website, and you don't have any classes, but you just have a website. You know, you're selling widgets um, or, or whatever, and and you want to manage your website. You use a content management system, a CMS. And there are many of them out there. Things like uh, Joomla or Zoops or Drupal, um, but that's not what we want to use. We want to use a course content management system. It's a content management system designed for managing courses. Uh, so it'll allow you to do things like keep grades or keep attendance or uh, uh, give out a test. Okay, A typical CMS will not do that. Then you also have a learning management system. Learning management system is actually designed to control the learning aspect of it. Uh, years ago when I was studying, uh, learning how to drive, they gave me this big old book and I had to go through the book and when I got to a certain section it says if you got this answer right go to page 55 if you got it wrong go to page 43 and so it kind of tracked me around where I'm supposed to go throughout the book okay the book was actually managing my learning in that sense told me where to go and how to go a learning management system is going to do something similar you may have a, a long lesson that has seven or eight components in it and you only get partially done with them and you have to leave well, the system can save what you've done, save where you are in that learning activity, and then allow you to come back and finish it later. A typical course content management system won't allow you to go partially through an activity and then come back later. Typical course content management systems like WebCT or Blackboard, like Moodle, like Claroline or Atutor uh, or these others, allow you to manage your course. Uh, and that's the main thing for those types of systems. So you've got systems like Moodle, uh, which allow you to uh, take attendance, allow you to create a schedule for the class, to, to store materials, to hand out materials, to collect homework, uh, to, uh, to give a test. Uh, those kinds of things that are done in a course content management system. Claroline would be another one. It's a similar type of thing. Look, even their advertising here, you can have your own private campus. Uh, Claroline, similar to uh, Moodle, is open source. You can download it, you can put it on your computer, and then you can manage all of your classes or your school using this particular system. A Tutor would be something similar as well. It's a learning management tool. Uh, actually, it's not a learning management tool, it's a course management tool. It allows you to uh, modify courses. Uh, and play with uh, all the things that I had mentioned earlier. So there are a number of those systems out there. By far the most popular open source system is Moodle, um, but Claroline is also a good system. Atutor is a good system. I've actually used all three of them before. Um, so they're very good systems. Again, they allow you to do things like manage your courses, manage uh, attendance, uh, grades, uh, exams, uploading of papers and whatnot. And, of course, it allows you to have access to a whole uh, plethora of different activities that uh, are built in or can be built into the system. One of the nice things, let me just jump off here in, as far as Moodle and open source things, is that you have hundreds, nay I say thousands of people building these little modules that they think are beneficial. Uh, and if someone builds the module, they make it available to everybody else, and now we have more greater flexibility in the, uh, 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 in the task of uh, teaching. Um, so these are content management systems, or more particularly course content management systems. And again, they're going to allow you to control the course. Even a whole school could do this. 
Um, they're not necessarily learning management systems. Uh, learning management systems sometimes can be embedded within them. I know that Moodle, for example, has one activity that's called a lesson, and it's something that you can finish partway and then come back later. Uh, but that's not typical with the other systems. SCORM, we've already talked about. XML is another way of writing code so that you can create unique materials. And for at our level as teachers, uh, we're not going to be too interested in SCORM or XML simply because that's more of a programming type of language and we don't want to necessarily delve into any of those. If you are interested in playing with something like SCORM, I would actually recommend you as teachers to go get EXE Learning and use this software to develop things because when you're done making whatever it is you're going to make there, you can save it as a SCORM compliant component and then you can use it at other places. Okay, let's jump on to some of the other uh, technologies that we have at our disposal. We have things like NetMeeting or GoToMeeting where we can have online virtual courses. We have things like Digital Samba and WizIQ that are more designed for education. And then we've got some bizarre things like Ustream. Let's go take a look at... Uh, um, well, let's go look at uh, GoToMeeting first of all. GoToMeeting is generally a uh, for payment uh, type of system and it's basically a meeting system allows you to meet gives you a whiteboard allows you to view um, allows you to view documents allows you to take things like attendance um, but it's and it's pay for digital samba is also well, some of it is free but very little very little as far as if you're gonna have a larger class if you're gonna have two meeting places this is uh, something that you could use. So if you have a class of 30 students and the teacher can't be there, but they can be here via Digital Samba, that would be free. If you wanted to have multiple locations, you'd have to start paying some money for this. But Digital Samba is more uh, designed for, uh, for educators. It's also designed for business, so it does a lot of the same types of things. Again, you can have a whiteboard, you can share documents, you can share desktops, um, so that you can have all those actions uh, throughout. WizIQ now is an online environment, but it is specifically designed for l teachers uh, to do things that are online. And you can put your course here online. And again, I say you can do um, uh, you can do a lot of the same things that you've done uh, in the other systems. Only they're designed for teachers and students. So you can share documents. You can give out little quizzes. Uh, you can, uh, obviously, you can chat, you can uh, share documents, you can share desktops. Um, <clears throat> well, this is designed more for teachers. Uh, so you may want to go look out WizIQ. Interestingly enough, there's a, a module that's made for Moodle, okay, that is a WizIQ module. So if you have a class that's running Moodle and you want to jump out to WizIQ to have a live session, there's an actual module that connects Moodle uh, to WizIQ. Uh, I've tried WizIQ before and uh, I do like the system. It is slow if you're using the free version, which I did use. I've used Digital Samba and that's also a good system. One that I should have added in here is uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, which uh, some of you have may have already seen or heard of, uh, but Google Hangouts is not really designed for educators, but it is free for up to, I believe, nine people. You can get together with Google Hangouts and have video discussions with nine different groups. You can share documents. You can share YouTube. You can uh, work on a document together. You can create a whiteboard. Uh, and there are a couple of other things that you can do with it. Uh, again, there's no attendance type of thing like you would probably be able to find in WizIQ, but it is a very nice tool that you could have at your disposal. Last thing I want to show you for this one is something called Ustream. <clears throat> with these other systems that we were looking at, things like Digital Samba or WizIQ, uh, or even Go to Meeting, it was the idea was that both the uh, the teacher or the leader and the people who were uh, the recipients or the students, they could both interact uh, online together. They could both talk. They could both be seen visually. At the same time, they could also share, you know, they could share a document. Ustream takes a different approach in that Ustream basically will allow me, okay, to stream a camera, you know, like this camera right here. And I can share this camera and put it on the internet. 
and then anybody who wants to have access to my camera will then be able to see what I'm doing. And it could be that I just put back here. I put a uh, I put a PowerPoint up here on the wall, and you can see what's that what that PowerPoint is, and you can see what's going on. But the downside is, so I can get a hundred, I can get a thousand people watching this feed, but I can't interact with them the same way that I could uh, with uh, something like uh, a Hangout. Uh, with this, I'm going to be doing most of the talking. Now, with Ustream, I can also create a little quiz. Okay, so let's say we are doing a conversation here, and or not a conversation, I'm giving a lecture, and I may ask a question, and I post it out there to you all on the page, and you can respond to that page. You can't talk, but you can respond to the page, and then I can show a summary of all the results that were done. So there is some interaction, uh, but Ustream is a quick and easy way to get stuff broadcast on the web free. You can also get them broadcast onto YouTube, and you can also store them on YouTube. Um, and there's a little of, of interaction with the, uh, with the little quick surveys that you can do with the system. And these are all different ways that you can have classes. Um, I don't know if uh, you guys had read a couple of months ago about a, um, a professor, I believe it was a professor from MIT or a professor from Harvard or somewhere from the Northeast, where he quit his job and started doing courses on technology, and he had hundreds of people signed up for his course, and they were all online. He could have used something like Ustream to access all of these people. <clears throat> So that would be uh, some type of conferencing software that's out there and available for, uh, for you as teachers. Take a little bit at, at uh, artificial intelligence and speech recognition and uh, mobile learning. Uh, artificial intelligence, or uh, more specifically natural language processing, uh, has to do with processing a language. I don't know if you have these new phones now where you can talk to the phone and say, you know, uh, find me an ice cream shop. Well, the computer then listens to that, and it has to analyze what it, those sounds are and then figure out what those sounds mean. Okay, And that all has to do with this natural language processing. Uh, primarily used right now in R&D. They are used, in, again, in some phones in a limited fashion uh, with, um, what would the word be, with, with uh, stock phrases that are used often so that they can be easily identified. The interesting thing about phones today is that you'll talk into the phone and that information then needs to be sent to the internet or to the, the main system so that it can be analyzed and then it's sent back, the information is sent back. So it does take a little time. <clears throat> this would also be used in something called uh, continuous language processing, basically analyzing the speech, not analyzing the specific sounds. It's trying to find out what it is that you mean. Discrete uh, sound pronunciation is where it's actually trying to identify the actual sounds that you make and are they quote unquote realistic. Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of neat things that are involved in that. Jump over to mobile learning, and there are a whole bunch of different things that we can now do with mobile learning because now we have things called cell phones. And we have these neat little uh, devices that are small enough to allow us to run around and, and see and do things. The, uh, the upside is their, is their uh, size. Uh, if you're dealing with a phone as well, the upside is going to be uh, that it's small and that it's portable. The downside for this is that uh, the screens are small. But we can do some types of interaction with it. <coughs> some of these com uh, phones and mobile systems have things like dictionaries and email and, and reading and vocab systems. Uh, and more and more applications are being designed so that they not only run on the web, but they also can run on your mobile device. There are also some teachers who are using it. And they may take their phone, they may take their iPhone or their, their Droid phone into class, and that's going to be their PowerPoint presentation system. They can hook that up to a projector and then do things with it. Uh, it's generally not something that can be used for in-depth uh, use, um, but if you're doing something light, like again, like a, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, like a Google presentation file, you know, that's something that you could probably do with a phone or an iPad. We're seeing more and more of this mobile device type of uh, learning capabilities. Uh, all this new tech, what in the world do we do with it all? All this new tech and how are we as teachers and administrators, how are we supposed to handle what we're going to be using? 
we want to make wise choices as teachers, as managers of money, and uh, acquire technologies uh, that are going to be best for our students, best for learning. Uh, we shouldn't just get technology for technology's sake. You know, uh, there was a TV show I watched a while ago where these geeky kids they went out and they sent a signal uh, through their computer all the way around the world so that they could turn on their lights rather than simply walk across the room and turn on their lights. And someone asked them, well, why in the world are you trying to do that? And the answer was, because we can. That's why we're trying to do that. That's why we're trying to send a signal around the earth to turn on our light. No, that's not why we buy technology. That's not why we acquire uh, technologies. We should be wise with the choices that we make. What's the value of this technology? I, I mean, I love technology. I live in this world of technology. But there are some times where I look at it and say, well, what's the advantage of having it? Is it going to be helpful to the learning process? Is it going to be helpful to the school? Is it going to be, uh, uh, is it, or is it just eye candy? Is it just fun? Is it just, uh, is it a non-learning thing? I don't want to buy those types of things. Uh, I want to buy things that are going to be helpful and useful and valuable. Um, and if I can do it without paying a lot of money, I'll do that as well. Uh, other questions that you may want to ask is, does it have tech support? Uh, someone like me requires very little tech support. So I may purchase something that is uh, cheaper because I don't need tech support. Uh, you, on the other hand, may want something that has more tech support. We go over here and look at something like Moodle. It has very little tech support. Uh, WizIQ, for example, is going to have a lot of tech support because it's a for-profit system that ha and you're paying money for it. Okay, so because you're paying money for it, you're going to get more tech support. Moodle or Claraline, they're not going to have any, they're not going to have a lot of tech support. Although, to be perfectly honest, they actually do have tech support. But, you know, do you have, does it have tech support? Do you need it? Uh, maybe you don't need it. Uh, do you have institutional support for it? I, I've worked in places where there's one lab in the whole school that's a Mac lab, and the school doesn't support it. Right? So you may get a Mac at that school, but they're not going to support it. I mean, opposite as well. You may be at a school where everybody's a Mac and you have a PC. Well, they're not going to support you possibly. So if you need help, you're, you're, you're in trouble because right? they're not going to try to help you. Um, okay, and then a couple other things that you want to look at when you're making choices is, you know, what is the cost? Is the cost too high? Um, I love open source, so I will try to gravitate toward the cheaper things. And it's usability. How user-friendly is it? Uh, if it's too difficult to use, I'm probably not going to go after it. I want to find something that's easier to use. And lastly, effectiveness. How effective is it for what you want to do? Does it meet your needs? And does it meet your needs in such a way that your students want to engage? Um, those are some of the choice, some of the uh, options, some of the ideas that you're going to have to grapple with as you make choices regarding the technologies that you're going to choose. Lastly, with new technologies comes new responsibilities. Uh, new technologies means there are going to be new ways for people to cheat. I remember about well, five or six years ago, I remember teachers saying everybody had to have their phones turned off, uh, phones put away, because there are people who were hiding a phone in their pocket and they were typing messages to somebody else who were looking for answers. And so it was a new way of cheating, new way of uh, copying. Um, so people try to circumvent that by doing a uh, a variety of rules. Another possible thing is to use something like Turnitin, which is a type of software that analyzes the writings that people make to see if it's actually theirs or whether they took it from some other location. Turnitin is a cost, if I'm not mistaken. It is a very good system for monitoring and assessing whether students are cheating or not. <clears throat> to me, that's a whole nother, um, a uh, whole nother uh, issue that should be brought in is uh, we as teachers should we be involved in monitoring whether our students are cheating or not um, and there are going to be a lot of people who will say yes that should be our job to police our students and uh, make sure that they're not cheating um, I also understand where people are saying look we should be teaching honesty we should be teaching uh, our students to be open and honest and fair and that if we teach them those morals then we won't need to worry about teaching them uh, keep policing them and making sure that they're not cheating. Uh, but, but that's definitely an issue. Computer hacking would be another issue. With all this information that is now put online, it's made available, uh, it's now user friendly, the possibility that people are going to hack in and steal information is very real. Um, so we as teachers need to be asking ourselves, even when we're acquiring software, how secure is it? 
um, you go to the bank online, you better make sure that you have an HTTPS uh, based system so that you know that the money that you're uh, the passwords that you're putting in are actually secure. Insecure information means that people are going to have a better chance of getting in and stealing information from your students, from your school, and that can cause big time problems. Can I also recommend that if you're going to be creating passwords that you make them kind of long? Don't make them a word. Use numbers and letters. Use uppercase and lowercase. That would be the best type of password. Finally, I would recommend that you don't write it down. Try to find some way to memorize it so that somebody who's just passing by can take a glimpse at your desk and say, oh, look, there's a password. <clears throat> there are other security measures that you can do, obviously locking down your system. I don't know how many times I have seen students walk away from their computer in the lab and they leave it unlocked. Um, you walk out of your office, you make sure that door closes and it's locked. You will leave your computer, you make sure that you lock it down so that nobody can get into it. A uh, variety of ways that you can do security. Passwording is just one of them. Lastly, machine translation. And these are people who are taking a document in one language and translating it into another and then calling it English. Uh, so they might write an essay uh, in French and drop it in a machine translator and they get it in English. Uh, and then they hand that in as their own paper. The system is getting better. They are certainly not exact, but they're definitely getting better and people can begin to use those. goes back to the earlier question, do we police people for cheating? And if we do, what measures do we need to be involved with there? I'm not here to talk about the morality of uh, policing students uh, or checking up on them. My only concern here is that because of we have these new technologies, we have new ways for people to use it for ill. And we should be aware of it and find out uh, what we can do to lessen, uh, lessen that. And that's all I have for this particular lesson. Uh, we were talking about some of these author, some of these uh, systems designed to help us create materials and manage materials, things like uh, Hot Potatoes and EXE and some of the course content management systems like Moodle and Claroline. We also talked about some uh, speech recognition and some of the tools that were being used there. We talked about some protocols. Most importantly, we talked about you guys making choices uh, with all of the new things that are out there. We want to be wise with our resources and use them to the best of our abilities. I do hope that you guys go out and investigate some of the tools that we ran across here today just to go play with them, to see what they're like, to see if possibly you could use those in your teaching and in your school. If you do have any questions, kindly let me know and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye now.